Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Mr. Ballin done uploaded another video and this title here, oh, this title here, Gruesome Crime Caught on Camera. Now look, I have a few of my Mr. Ballin reactions that are age restricted. So, you know, we're going to see how this plays out. But again, make sure you guys are subscribed to his channel. Like I always say, the flannel king himself, this brother is incredible with the way the way he tell these stories. And as always, shout out to all the good humans. Link is always in the description for those who are asking. So we ain't gonna waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. The next time you're out walking around the streets of London, look up. Chances are good you will find a camera somewhere nearby. Because as of publishing this video right now today, London is one of the most surveilled cities in the entire world with citizens being filmed up to 70 times a day. Now, that. the reason for all of these cameras is to deter and more effectively prosecute criminal activity. But the vast majority of the footage, these hundreds of thousands of cameras all over London capture every day is just normal people doing normal things. But, periodically, these cameras will capture people doing just horrible, illegal things. And today, I'm going to tell you the story behind one of those types of videos. Now, go. at first glance, the video clip, which we're going to play, will not be that shocking. But trust me, with context, it's horrifying. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of this the Strange, intro, Dark, and Mysterious man. delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place Ooh. because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, in your will, please give the like button a treasure map that leads to a pot of gold. However, replace the gold with a $6 gift certificate to Blockbuster. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. Is there any more On the morning of Friday, June 11th, 2021, in a suburb in the northwest of London, a man named David Klein woke up to his early morning alarm. David rolled out of bed, he got dressed, and he very carefully made his way downstairs to start getting ready for work. As David moved around this old brick house he was in, he was very careful not to make much noise because he didn't want to wake up his roommate, a 67-year-old widow named Deborah Chong. Deborah was technically David's landlord, Real but photo. she didn't charge him any rent. The two had met in church, and when Deborah had learned that David didn't really have a place to live, she had immediately volunteered her house and told David to come live with her for free. David couldn't believe her generosity Damn. and immediately took her up on the offer. So and then after he had moved in, he learned that he was far from the first person who Deborah had allowed to come and live in her house rent free. It would turn out Deborah, whose late husband had given her a ton of money in his will, felt like it was her responsibility and her duty oh. to use her ample resources to house people that were kind of down on their luck. She said it was her way of serving God. Also, David got the impression that Deborah just liked having... Those are the people who get taken advantage of the most. The ones with good intentions and just a heart, pretty much, you know? Don't know where this story is going to end up, but just, you know, letting people stay there and, and especially if they know the history, like uh, that she has this money, got to be careful, got to be careful her duty to use her ample resources to house people that were kind of down on their luck. She said it was her way of serving God. Also, David got the impression that Deborah just liked having people living with her in her home. It made her happy. But David would notice a distinct change in Deborah's personality around the time the COVID-19 pandemic started in early 2020. At that time, Deborah, like many other people, was very concerned about this global health crisis and wanted to learn more about what was happening and what could happen in the future. Right. And so the way she did that is she obsessively began going on YouTube and began consuming COVID-19 related content and political content surrounding COVID-19. 
COVID-19 and the pandemic and lockdowns, Man. but instead of becoming more educated and well-versed on what was happening in the world, Deborah's constant consumption of COVID-19 related content on YouTube really just made her feel incredibly stressed out and anxious. And as David began to see firsthand, Deborah's sudden high levels of anxiety really began wreaking havoc on her life. Years earlier, Deborah was officially diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, uh. which is a mental illness that causes bouts of psychosis, which is like losing touch with reality. Now, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, her symptoms were so mild that she basically led a totally normal life. But once the pandemic started and her YouTube quest for information I caused that spike in stress and anxiety, it caused a spike in her symptoms. And so she began suffering from frequent and lengthy hallucinations and delusions. One time, David came home from work, and when he went inside the house, he found Deborah sitting at the kitchen table, diligently writing these handwritten letters to various British public figures. And when David asked her what she was doing, she explained to him that these British public figures were speaking directly to her through the YouTube videos she was watching. And so these handwritten letters were her response letters back to these public figures. In May of 2021, Deborah's hallucinations had gotten so bad that doctors intervened and forcibly injected her with an antipsychotic medication. And while these meds definitely reduced Deborah's symptoms, they also had some pretty negative side effects as well. Namely, they totally curbed her appetite and they made sleeping really challenging. And so pretty quickly, those two side effects combined made Deborah feel really weak and tired basically all the time, to the point where she sometimes needed David to literally hold her up by her arm just to walk down the street. Now, David, of Man. course, had no problem helping Deborah with whatever she wanted. I mean, she had done so much for him, but David had work, and so he was only really available to help her in the mornings and in the evenings during the week. And so he had actually spoken to Deborah about hiring a full-time caretaker that could live with her and just take care of her at the level she needed all the time. And Deborah was open to it. She actually called a company she that offered that service and they told her they would get someone out to her, but it would take some time before her caretaker was actually assigned to her. Now, David was really pleased with this development, but he really wished they would speed it up because again, every time he was- Yeah, that gotta be tough, man. Again, don't know how the story going to play out, but it's like he, he feels like, you know, he at least owes her that much. But at the same time, you know, he's still trying to live and work and do all this stuff. Um, it's like you feel bad. But, you know, she do, do have the money to afford a caregiver. And I think that is like uh, uh, the best as far as having someone with you uh, to watch you all the time. Um, but like I said, don't know how this story going to turn out, but it's just, it's just crazy how, like when you go on the internet and you just, sometimes you can go down these rabbit holes that'll lead you just, woo, you know what I mean? But it would take some time before her caretaker was actually assigned to her. Now, David was really pleased with this development, but he really wished they would speed it up. Because again, every time he was away all day at work, he knew Deborah was home by herself. Right. And so he was just so worried something was gonna happen to her when he was gone. So after David gathered up all of his things and very quietly made his way from the kitchen to the front door, he paused for a moment and said a silent prayer in his head for Deborah's safety and protection while he was away at work. And then he opened the front door, quietly went outside, shut the door behind him and headed off to work. A few hours later, David came home from work. He went back inside of the house. And the first thing he did is he called out for Deborah. But Deborah didn't call back and the house was very quiet. And so David took off his shoes and walked around the first floor, kind of calling out for Deborah as he walked. But again, there was no answer. And so after walking the whole first floor and not finding her, he yelled one more time really loudly, hey, Deborah, are you here? And after hearing nothing, he pulled out his phone and he called Deborah. And as the phone was ringing, he could hear Deborah's phone ringing upstairs. And so he thought, okay, maybe Deborah is upstairs. She fell asleep and her phone's just next to her on the bed. And so with David's phone still calling Deborah's phone, David began walking upstairs. And when he got to the top of the stairs, he just followed the sound of Deborah's ringing phone into her bedroom. And when he went in there, 
Deborah was not in there. Her phone was, though, and so were her glasses. They were both just sitting on the bed. Those were two items that Deborah would bring with her anywhere she went. And so trying not to panic, David called out a few more times for Deborah, but again, there was no answer. And so after quickly searching her bedroom and not finding her, he searched all the other rooms upstairs, but again, she just was not there. She was not in the house. And so David began calling and texting friends from church and other people that knew Deborah to see if anybody had heard from her or knew where she was. But no one did, and the only people who had recently talked to her said she was totally incoherent, talking about spirits and demons and the destruction of all mankind. And Man. so, believing Deborah must be suffering from a schizophrenic hallucination somewhere out in the city, David picked up his phone again and he called the police. When the police showed up at the house, David filled them in on what was going on, and the police told him, hey, look, we'll go back and review all of the CCTV camera footage taken from outside of your house. We're bound to see footage of Deborah leaving her house at some point, and then we can just watch where she goes. And so David felt reassured, and the police felt very confident, but when the police went back to the station and began reviewing all of this security oh, footage taken from roughly outside of Deborah's house, there was no footage of her ever leaving the house. There was only footage the day before of Deborah going into the house, but she never left. And so naturally, the police went back to Deborah and David's house, and they thoroughly searched that house, believing Deborah had to be in there somewhere. But despite searching everywhere in this house, in every crawl space, in the attic, the basement, every closet, everywhere, she wasn't there. It would take the police. See that? Ooh, yeah, sorry, I had to make sure I was recording that right there. When that, when he says that, when they searched everywhere, this and this, and he's look at the footage, and you don't see him. That be tripping me out, man. I know it's probably, it's going to be revealed, but that be tripping me out. Like, where the hell? You know what I mean? Damn. Nearly a month, but they would eventually figure out where Deborah went. A month? And to say they were surprised at where she went is a massive understatement. But to understand what happened, we have to go back to the very beginning of Deborah's very strange disappearance story. It all started about 10 months before Deborah actually went missing in August of 2020. That month, Deborah met a 36 year old woman named Gemma Mitchell at one of her church prayer groups. Like Deborah, Gemma was very religious, and so the two women became fast friends despite being 30 years apart in age. Deborah say. would confide in Gemma about her mental health struggles, and Gemma would confide in Deborah about her house slash financial troubles. Basically, Gemma, a couple years earlier, had given money to a contractor to fix up her house, oh, no. but the contractor had taken her money, not done any work, and then run off, basically robbing Gemma. But Gemma really needed to do these renovations, and so she wound up hiring a second contractor who did begin work, but during this process, Gemma realized she would never be able to recover the money that was stolen from her from the first contractor, and so when she realized she wasn't going to get that money, she knew she would not be able to fully pay the second contractor for his work. And so when the second contractor found out he was not going to get paid, he stopped work immediately, despite the fact that there was no working heat in Gemma's house, and there was a huge hole in her roof. But Damn. Gemma had no way to fix this, and so she and her mom were just living in this house that was just totally freezing all the time. Deborah had been so moved by Gemma's situation that very quickly after meeting her, she offered 200,000 pounds to Gemma to finish the renovations on her house yeah. under the condition that one room in Gemma's new house would be solely dedicated to Christian ministry. Gemma was overwhelmed with gratitude. She could not believe Damn. that Deborah was willing to do this for her. And so, of course, she agreed to her terms without any hesitation. After that, the two women began texting all the time about this renovation project. Deborah would suggest paint colors and different things to do with the inside of the house. And Gemma would text updates about the different contractors she had talked to who could do pieces of the renovation. Deborah was always inviting Gemma over to her house, and she even began referring 
to Gemma as her sister. And Gemma loved it, because Gemma actually had always wanted to be much closer with her own biological sister, but they had kind of drifted apart. And so for Gemma, Deborah Why? really did feel like the sister she was supposed to have. But their relationship was about to change drastically. In May of 2021, so eight months after the two women met for the first time, and one month before Deborah would vanish, Deborah was forcibly injected with that antipsychotic medication in order to combat her paranoid schizophrenia. And right after Deborah got this injection, she began treating Gemma totally differently. She basically stopped communicating altogether with Gemma, and then in the rare times she would text Gemma, it was just to berate her about being a hoarder or being too messy and sloppy. Gemma Damn. didn't really know what to make of her friend's new behavior, but she knew, you know, Deborah was going through a really tough time, and so Gemma just kind of took the abuse and didn't say anything. When Gemma did try to talk to Deborah by asking about the renovation project, which was quickly approaching on the horizon, Deborah would tell Gemma not to talk about it, that it was too stressful and just don't bring it up again. And then one day, Deborah just called Gemma out of the blue and said, I'm not funding the renovation anymore. Oh, it's over. You're on your own. No. Gemma felt totally devastated and pleaded with Deborah to <laughs> please reconsider. But Deborah was not about to change her mind. And in fact, on this call, she would tell Gemma, you know, hey, you should just sell your house and in fact until you sell your house don't contact me and then deborah hung up Gemma didn't know what to do she felt like she really could not sell her house because it was kind of like a family heirloom that had been passed down for generations and so it just felt wrong to sell it but on the other hand without help she would never have enough money to fix the house up it's and so crazy, she was totally man. stuck and she felt like her only option was to go to deborah and have one more conversation and just really plead her case and see if maybe there was some chance deborah would change her mind so on the morning of june 11th 2021 so this is the day that deborah goes missing Gemma showed up on deborah's porch and rang her doorbell she arrived just after david had left for work a few moments later deborah slowly made her way to the door she opened it up she saw Gemma out there and asked you know what's going on and Gemma just very politely said would you please let me come in and can we just talk one more time about the renovation and deborah who was not very enthused at the idea of having this conversation said you know what okay come on in and so Gemma would go inside and the two women would go sit down and they'd exchange some pleasantries and then at some point when there was a break in the conversation Gemma brought up the renovation she had actually written out this whole speech about how incredible Deborah was and how these renovations if they went through with them would mean so much to her Gemma and her family but as Gemma is going through this pitch, Deborah just cuts her off and says, Gemma, I'm sorry, but my decision is final. I am not paying for the renovation. Damn. I'm sorry. A little while later, both Gemma and Deborah would leave Deborah's house. And there actually is CCTV footage that shows the pair walking on Deborah's street right outside of her house. However, the reason the police did not flag this footage when they first were scanning all of that footage to figure out where Deborah went is because when you watch the footage of the two women together, it actually only looks like one person. It looks like Gemma. But Gemma is wheeling a huge suitcase right behind her. Oh, and as it would turn out, no. Deborah was inside of it. It's assumed that after Deborah was forcibly given that antipsychotic medication for her paranoid schizophrenia, that it really leveled her out. She was suddenly thinking very clearly for the first time in months. And in this clear state of mind, it's believed she realized the 200,000 pound gift she was giving to Gemma, someone she barely knew, was a bad decision. And so she just wanted to back out of it. And so back inside of Deborah's house, when Deborah and Gemma are sitting there and Gemma is doing her speech to try to convince Deborah to change her mind and Deborah is saying, no, my final answer is no, it's over. That's when Gemma snapped. She grabbed a blunt object. We don't know what it was. And she smashed Deborah right over the skull and fractured her skull, causing Deborah to fall unconscious and slump onto the. See, that's my whole thing. She went from needing to get renovations done to to killing somebody like how do you go from that to that you know 
Like, I mean, I, I know it sucks that she said she backed out of it, but at the same time, at least she still got your life, your freedom. You know what I mean? Man, just people, how they just snap like that, man. A blunt object, we don't know what it was, and she smashed Deborah right over the skull and fractured her skull, causing Deborah to fall unconscious and slump onto the floor. And then Gemma leapt on top of Deborah's unconscious body. Gemma pulled out a knife and cut Deborah's head off. And then afterward, Gemma cleaned up all the blood in the house and then stuffed Deborah's body and head into that big suitcase. And then after Gemma stole several legal documents and a copy of Deborah's will, she walked out of Deborah's house with Deborah in the suitcase behind her. Gemma would walk with Deborah all the way back to her house, and then she would leave the suitcase, with Deborah still inside of it, in her backyard. She would just leave it there for two weeks, and then after those two weeks, Gemma would take the suitcase again, still with Deborah's body inside of it, and transport it 250 miles away to a seaside town where she would dump it. And in that seaside town, some vacationers would discover Deborah's body and call it into the police. On July 6th, 2021, police would arrest Gemma on suspicion of murder. When they arrested her, they showed up at her house and used a battering ram to smash in her front door. And then when the door finally literally smashed open, Gemma was just standing there waiting for the police as if she knew this was gonna happen and she's just waiting to be taken away. When the police would actually go into Deborah's house and search it, they would find a fake copy of Deborah's will where all of Deborah's estate was handed over to Gemma and Gemma's mother. Damn. In October of 2022, Gemma was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 34 years. To this day, Gemma insists she did not kill Deborah. So that's going to do it. If you Finally, a sentence. Well deserved. My goodness, man. Like, I get, I get that she was upset about her backing out. Like I said, I get that. But to that extent, where well, you got to cut somebody's head off, like, Like, it's like people be so in the moment, caught up in the moment that they don't think like they're going to get caught. Like, she didn't think of like, oh, all the cameras or nothing like that. Although she lived out there, and she she probably she knows about them, but she didn't think about them, you know, because they're mine. That's just crazy. Wow. Wow. Shout out to all the footage, man. I mean, left the back, the suitcases in her backyard and put them in her car and just drove like you sit there trying to plan. Like, come on, man. Come on. All right. Again, appreciate you guys coming over and watching, man. And shout out to Mr. Baller. Peace out.